chapter 12 is going to sort of be the um, last chapter that's going to have sort of a um, focus on um, individuals to a certain extent, although there is some business deductions talked about in here to a certain extent. But um, after that, we'll be on uh, the road to talking about corporations, okay? So uh, we're going to focus on tax credits and payments here. And uh, there are a variety of credits. There are several discussed in the chapter. We're not going to go through every single one of them. I picked out some of the uh, ones that I thought were either a little more interesting or maybe a little more uh, involved in the calculations uh, to give us some time to work with those uh, together. We will only be held on the exam to those that we talk about in the lecture. If you want some more information about some of those other ones, of course, you can look through the chapter to see uh, how some of those work, okay? All right, so you take a look, and um, we want to make sure that we understand how a tax credit works and how it is different than a deduction, okay? A deduction is going to reduce the tax base, going to reduce the taxpayer's taxable income. Tax credits go directly against the taxpayer's liability. So they obviously have more of a benefit uh, to the taxpayer uh, for a couple of reasons. One uh, in particular is it is not affected by the taxpayer's tax rate. We've already used the tax rate to calculate the tax liability and then we get to take the credit directly against that. So it really doesn't matter uh, what the tax rate is of the uh, taxpayer. Um, if you take a look at our credits and they fall into two categories. Refundable credits are paid even if um, it exceeds the taxpayer's tax liability. So they can actually get an additional refund uh, for what we call refundable credits. Okay, so you take a look at this example, and we have this uh, taxpayer tax taxable income of twenty-one thousand, and uh, the income is uh, his income tax liability is two thousand six hundred and eighty-four. Ted's employer withheld thirty-two hundred. Well, he's entitled to that five hundred and sixteen dollar uh, refund. So tax payments are considered refundable, thus they generate a refund. Non-refundable credits are not paid if they exceed the taxpayer's tax liability. So now we've got taxable income of $1,320 and the tax is $312 and the child care tax credit here is $225. The credit can be used to reduce the tax liability to zero, but uh, she doesn't get to take this extra whatever it comes up to um, amount, uh, 1,225 minus 132, whatever that extra amount is, she can't take that. She can't get a refund for that. She's capped of just using that uh, child tax care credit to reduce her tax liability to zero. Okay? So, uh, unlike the payment that Ted had here. Okay? All right, let's go ahead and uh, you can see some of the listing here, refundable credits. We already talked about taxes paid, withheld during the year, uh, earned income tax credit, Affordable Care Act premium tax credit, non-refundable credits, and you can see some of those listed that we'll talk about. Now, one thing with non-refundable credits is once they've reduced that tax amount to zero, some of them do carry forward into, uh, in one case, it carries back into other years. So you don't lose it entirely if you don't take it in any one year. And that depends on what type of credit we're talking about. Okay. So you take a look and um, they tell us that uh, if something can be carried forward, um, then we would want to take that. Other credits are not subject to carryover uh, provisions and are lost and because some credits are refundable and others are not, uh, and because some credits are subject to carryover provision while others are not, um, there is a strategy as to how, I don't know if it's a strategy, but just a way that you would take those to make sure that you don't lose any amounts that maybe would carry over or maybe would be refundable. So we've got Elijah here who has a tax credit of $1,000. He qualifies for two tax credits, a $400 credit, which is non-refundable, 
and $800 credit, which is refundable. And if we were to have a tax liability of 1000 and take the um, refundable first, then the remaining tax due is 200 and if you were to go ahead and then try to take the non-refundable, you'd be capped at 200 even though there's 400 there, because they've already reduced the tax liability to zero. So the order to go would to be do what? First use up all of the non-refundable, the 400, and then you've got what? You've got this 800 refundable that's left. You take that one, now you've actually generated a refund of $200 because the uh, credit B was refundable. Okay, so uh, obviously you would take these this way. You wouldn't take them the other way. And it's not like they tell you you have to take them in certain orders. So obviously someone would go ahead and take them uh, in, the, um, in the order for first taking the, uh, the um, non-refundable and then the refundable. Okay, all right. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at general business credits okay and these general business credits there are a variety of them and they are kind of unique in that you would add all of those different general uh, business tax credits up and then um, comport, report them all on this one form uh, 3800 so you can see some of them they're trying to pr promote certain business activity such as research, oil, recovery, reforestation, starting a pension plan, and each credit is tallied up on a separate form and then carried over to the uh, general tax business, general business tax credit form 3880, not that the form 3800, not that the form is important, but uh, take a look at the uh, maximum that you're able to take on these, okay? So the maximum, is going to be the greater of the tentative minimum tax. Did it say greater there? I might have missed that when I copied that over. So it's going to be the greater. The greater of the tentative minimum tax. This amount relates to alternative minimum tax that we probably won't get to. Um, but uh, just remember the greater of the tentative minimum tax or 25% of the net regular tax liability that exceeds 25,000. Uh, net regular tax liability is a regular tax liability reduced for certain non-refundable credits such as the child dependent care expense, etc. Now you come over and you take a look at uh, this Floyd and Floyd has a general business tax credit for the year of 70,000. The net income tax is 150,000, the tenant of minimum minimum tax is 130, and Floyd's regular tax liability is 150. He has no other tax credits. Floyd's general business credit allowed for the tax year is computed as and again it's going to be the greater of so we take the net income tax of 150 and then the greater of either the tenant of minimum tax or this 25% uh, of the uh, 150,000 net regular tax minus the uh, 25,000 threshold that they give us there. So if you go ahead and do that calculation, obviously the tenant of minimum tax is much larger. So we take the tenant of minimum tax off of the net income tax and um, the amount of general business tax credit allowed for the year is 20,000. Now because he had what? 70,000, then he can go ahead and take the remaining amount and he can carry those back or forward and uh, they don't say here on this slide, but you can carry it back one year and forward uh, 20 years. Okay, so um, that's how you would calculate the maximum and then they can carry forward carry back for these general tax credits and these various things. And we're not going to talk about all these, but uh, you have these various types of, uh, of general business taxes. Okay. Now, uh, unused general business tax credits. What do you do with those unused that are left over? 
and you take a look and they tell us that uh, the taxpayer may receive a tax refund as a result of carry back. So you can carry back for one year. Any remaining unused credits can be carried forward for 20 years. Okay. Now, when you carry the ones back, you're going to carry, um, I should say forward, you're going to carry the ones forward using a FIFO approach, first in, first out. So you take a look and you can see that they have these amounts for these different years. They have all these different carryovers. And for the current year, um, the general business tax credit for 2018 is 40000 The total allowed um, for 2018 is 50000 Obviously, you can't use all of that. And so when he starts to deduct those, he goes first with what? the 4,000, then the 6,000, then the 2,000. So there is still, what, 38,000 of the current year that is available to be used. So then you would use up, what, the current year is using the FIFO approach, and then there is still 2,000 left that he can carry forward um, to uh, 2019, okay? So you have this 40,000, you use up the old ones first, right? And then any remaining amount that has been uh, left over, in this case the 38,000 can be used for, uh, would be used of this year's, and then um, you still have this 2,000, okay? All right, so let's take a look at this treatment of the um, best discredited treatment applicable to unused business credits. And uh, what, unused amounts are first carried back, what, one year and then carried forward for 20 years, right? Okay. All right, good. Let's look at this one that I think does a better job than the example of showing how um, we would uh, use the FIFO approach to carry these, uh, carry these forward and then it, what amount would be left over. So. We have Molly has generated general business tax credits over the years that have not been utilized. And you see the different years that they uh, came up. In the current year, 2017, her business generates an additional 15,000 general business credit. In 2017, based on her tax liability for credits, she can utilize general business credits up to 20,000. So they went and did the calculation. She can use up to 20,000. And she goes ahead and does what? First uses them in order of L oldness, FIFO. I don't know how old they are. I don't know how old is the word. Okay, and so we go ahead and we subtract the 25, the 75, the 5,000, the 2016. So she's got a total from previous years of 19,000. Okay, now utilization for the current year, she's going to use up what? a thousand from the current year so if she has a general business tax credit in 2015 of a thousand then she can carry what she can carry up uh, fourteen thousand into that uh, into the next you know 2018 and carry the continue to carry that forward and then she would use that first in the next year and continue on going forward like that okay Okay, so basically use up the old ones first, right? Okay. All right, good. Uh, rehab re uh, re rehabilitation expenditure credit. Um, what happens here? Um, what Congress looked at here is they wanted to avoid situations where businesses would start to abandon old inner city buildings and whatnot, and they want them to stay in sort of historical districts and whatnot. And so uh, what they did was they started giving credit if you rehabilitated a building or whatever for your business that uh, was rehabilitating basically older buildings. And if you did that, they were gonna give you a tax credit for that to encourage companies to do that. Uh, I used to work across the street from this old building. Um, and uh, it didn't have much going on. It did have a small restaurant in there that was sort of like a cheap, greasy spoon type restaurant. And we went to lunch over there one day and we had a sign-in sheet at some meeting that we had and I had just started. They gave me the sign-in sheet because that meant I had to write up the interview. 
when we would go and, and talk to agencies, we interview them and we document that by writing up the interview. So they give me the sign-in sheet. We stop at this restaurant and um, I can't find the sign-in sheet when I'm coming out of there. When I get back to the office, I put it in a book I had, I can't find it. So I go back to that restaurant and I'm making the poor guys dig through the garbage trying to find that sign-in sheet because I'm like, it's got to be here somewhere. And so we could never find it. So I go back and I finally confess I lost the sign-in sheet. My supervisor tells me, oh no, I took it out of your book because I wanted to see who was in there. I'm like, okay, thanks a lot. Well, a little while later, you have Loma Prieta earthquake and that building becomes, uh, you know, re uh, un unsafe. So they think they're going to tear the building down and then they find out it's a historical site and they can't turn it, tear it down. So what they ended up doing was building a whole other building next to it and rehabilitating that smaller building there where the, rest, where the restaurant was and they turned it into like this really nice restaurant. So every time I'd go to that restaurant after that, I would say, you know, where we're sitting right now used to be the kitchen. Now, I made these people go through the garbage. Okay, so, all right, yeah. Well, note to self, don't tell that story anymore at dinner or otherwise, because no one's ever impressed by it. Okay. So anyway, um, what happens? The building that they build next to it, no tax credit for that. Expanding on that, building on that, if they put a parking lot or something, a garage in that building, there's a huge building that they put right next to it, no tax credit for that. But they get tax credit for what? For the rehabilitation of that historical site, whatever, right? Okay. Now, when you look at that, um, they give us different rates, okay? If it was not a historical site necessarily, but a building that had been placed in service before 1936. And guys, please don't ask me how Congress decided 1936 was the appropriate cutoff for that, okay? Probably when they were doing it, it was probably, you know, something six, 2006 or something. They just went back a certain amount of years, whatever, okay? Um, if it's a historical site, then the credit is 20%. I think probably for that case, the uh, developers that put together that uh, some of you may end up over there. It's a pretty popular building. It's, uh, I think it ended up getting an address of 101 Fremont. Is it 101 Fremont? I forget. It was a Fremont Street address that it got in San Francisco because the old building faced out on Fremont, even though the building they built took up the whole block and the entrance there was on Beale Street. Go Beale, Fremont in San Francisco. But anyway, um, you may end up in that building at some point, taking a look at that. It's kind of a famous building there. Um, I'm trying to remember, the name of the restaurant is Town Hall, so it's a pretty nice restaurant if you ever end up over there. But anyway, so you take a look, and uh, they probably got the 20% for a historical site, 10% uh, if it's not a historical, but it has that cutoff in 1936, okay? Now, when taking the credit, it is reduced by... Uh, the, the amount that you add for what you spend on the rehabilitation is going to be reduced by the credit. Okay, so let's just look at this example. Juan spent 60000 to rehabilitate a building that had an adjusted basis of 40000 that had been placed in service in 1932. So we got the 1936. It's old enough. We're going to get the 10% credit because they don't tell us anything about being a historical site. Uh, he is allowed a $6,000 credit. He spent what? He spent $60,000 to rehabilitate it, so it's on not on the original cost, it's on whatever you spent to rehabilitate it, right? So he spent $60,000, uh, 10% 10 of that is $6,000, and now the, uh, he'll get that credit, but now the new basis of the building, or what's added to the basis of the building, is not the full $60,000, it's $60,000 minus what? the $6,000 credit that he got. So essentially reducing the basis of that so there'll be some additional you know, tax that will be paid if he ultimately disposes of the building, okay? If the building was a historic structure, then we would use what? Then we would use the 20%, okay? All right, that's the way that pretty much works. Now, um, you take a look. And there is some requirements as to how long you stay uh, in that, uh, you know, that you continue to use that building because they don't want you to just get the tax credit and then walk, right? So they will make you recapture some of that if you walk early. But 
let's just take a look at um, to qualify for the credit the building must be substantially rehabilitated meaning that you're spending an amount that is greater than the adjusted basis of the property before the rehabilitation or five thousand dollars so you know it doesn't take very long probably to get over that uh, adjusted basis and obviously the five thousand won't take you long to get over that uh, qualified rehabilitation expenditures do not include the cost of acquiring the building, cost of facilities related to the building, uh, such as parking lots, cost of enlarging an existing building. Again, that section that they added to that, that would not be part of that. Okay. Now, you do have to recapture if you don't stay long enough because remember the idea was getting them to stay in the inner city and that and not just sort of you know, abandoned uh, areas that were maybe getting a little older. So, rehabilitation credits must be added to the taxpayer's federal income tax liability recapture for the year in which the rehabilitated property is disposed of prematurely or if it ceases to be a qualifying property. The rehabilitation expenditure credit recapture applies to a holding period requirement of five years. So, if you get out of it early, they're going to make you recapture some of that credit. You're going to have to add that back to uh, the basis of that uh, property when you go and uh, sell that, or, or I should say subtract that, rather not add it back, but subtract it from the base of the property when you sell it. Okay. So let's just take a look, and they give us a schedule um, as to when you get out of it early, and I think we see that schedule. I think I stuck that schedule on the next page. Yeah, as to uh, when you go ahead and do that. So let's just look at that schedule first. You can see the different percentages, okay, depending on uh, how long you stayed under the five years. If you go the five years, you don't have to recapture anything, right? Okay, so let's just take a look here. And on March 15, 2016, Rashad places in service $30,000 of rehabilitation expenditures on a building qualifying for the 10% credit. So he got a, what, $3,000 credit was allowed and the basis of the building was increased to $27,000 because, again, whatever the credit is, you take that um, off of the basis. The building was sold on December 15, 2019. Now, I'm looking at that, and that means that, what, March 15th, 2017 is one year. March 15th, 2018 is two years. March uh, 15th, 2019 should be three years, right? And so we're under four, but over three, aren't we? Right? Okay. So I'm not sure. I think it's a typo. Because they say because they held the rehabilitation property for more than two years, but fewer than four. So it doesn't make any sense today. I think they wanted to say what? More than three years, more than three years, but fewer than uh, but fewer than four years. They're in the forty percent category. Now they picked up the right number as to what needs to be recaptured, but I don't know why they said they're not they're not in the two to three, there are two to four. There is no two to four. It goes from three to four, right? Okay, so they're in that range there. They're more than three, but uh, less than four. So they're in the 40% category. Okay, oops. So if you come over, uh, of the credits, 1,200 is going to be added to the 2019 tax liability. So it's not the basis that gets adjusted. It's your liability that gets adjusted. You're going to have to recapture what? 40%. You got the tax credit before, right? And now you're having to add that to your tax liability in 2019 to recapture that 1200 Okay. So you got to stay for a certain amount of time. If you don't, they make you give some of the, re, uh, some of the uh, credit back. Okay. All right. Those are the percentages there. Okay. So let's take a look. Which of the following correctly describes the tax credit? Uh, for rehabilitation expenditure, the cost of enlarging any existing building is a qualifying expenditure? No, right? That's not correct. The cost of the facilities related to the building, parking lot, garage structures? No, can't do that. No recapture provision, pardon my cursor, is applied. No, there is a recapture provision if you don't stay the full five years, right? 
And so obviously what, well, I don't know if it's obviously because I guess it could be none of these, but you see the answer B. No credit is allowed for rehabilitation of personal use property. So you can't sit there and say, well, I'm going to, you know, I bought this house and it was built in 1930 and I'm going to have to remodel it and all that. So I want a tax credit for that. It doesn't work. Okay. Okay, good. All right. Uh, several years ago, Sarah purchased a structure for 150000 that was placed in service in 1929. So we're clearing 1936 pretty easily. In the current year, she incurred qualifying rehabilitation expenditures of 200000 The amount of tax credit for rehabilitation expenditures and the amount by which uh, the building's basis for cost recovery would increase as a result of rehabilitation First off, nothing about a historical structure, so we're in 10% category, right? So we're going to take that 200,000 and we're going to multiply it by 10%. Not much help there. We know the answer would have to be A, B, C, or D, right? Now, what, she's going to, what is she going to do? She's going to take that credit and that credit is going to come off of what she spent on the rehabilitation, right? And so she only gets to take 180,000 as um, adding to the basis of the building for the rehabilitation. And so A is the correct answer. Okay. All right, good. Let's take a look at the work opportunity tax credit. Um, what happens here? I'm not exactly sure if I remember when they started doing this stuff. I think it was during Clinton's administration though when um, they were trying to have companies provide incentive to hire individuals that maybe were on welfare maybe getting food stamps that kind of thing okay and if you hired those individuals they would give you a tax credit if you met certain requirements for the amount of money that you paid them in their salaries right they would give you credit for that up to certain limitations. Now you look at that and you say, well, big deal. I mean, they could have deducted the wages as a legitimate business expense anyway, and then they wouldn't have to pay tax on as much income, right? But that's a what? That's a deduction. It is not as advantageous as what? As a tax credit that they would give them. So there is an incentive there beyond just the hiring and paying those individuals their wages. Now, the theme with these sort of things, though, is that if you get the tax credit for it, they will not let you, what, deduct it as an expense against your, um, your income, right, and it's against your revenue. So um, you're going to have to choose one or the other. But, of course, most companies, I can't think of any that wouldn't, would prefer the tax credit, right? Okay. So we can go ahead and take a look, and the tax credit is generally equal to 40% of the first six thousands of about six thousand dollars of wages and this is per employee and it's for the first 12 months of employment okay they're not going to pay you know to let you carry this forward you know you have someone working for you for 30 years and they're going to give you that credit every year it doesn't work that way it's for the first 12 months of employment of employment okay if you take this for what credit purposes you can't take it as a tax deduction you know against your revenue as an expense deduction against your revenue okay so for an employee to qualify for the 40%, the employee must be certified as a designated local agency as being a member of one of the targeted groups. And I don't know exactly how they do that. There must be some sort of entity that's there that's you know sanctioned by the state or something to say, okay, this person qualifies. So you want that sort of uh, documentation. And they have to have completed at least 400 hours of service for the employer. Now I look at that part and I'm like, okay, 400 hours is a pretty, uh, I don't know, to me seems like a pretty easy threshold. Uh, how many work hours we talked about last time? 2,080? So you're not really even giving them what? You're giving them like a little under a quarter of full-time employment. Okay, but all right, you know, let's just go ahead and accept it that this 400 is enough. I think they could have made it a little bit more, but if an employee meets the first condition but not the second, then the credit is reduced down to 25%. So they'll still give you credit of 25% as long as the person worked a piddly, what, minimum of 120 hours. So I don't know. I feel like they're making this a little easy 
to get some credits here by hiring some individuals, but what are you going to do? Okay, so you take a look and they tell us in this example that Green Company hires four individuals who are certified to be members of a qualified targeted group. Again, probably people that were receiving food stamps or something like that before coming off of welfare essentially. And yeah, you're going to go ahead and hire them, right? Green Company worked opportunity credit is 9600 times the four employees. So it's the 40% category because they worked what? More than the 400 hours. So we got that covered. Uh, or at least 400 hours, you got that covered, and then you uh, multiply that times the wages, the first 6,000 of wages anyway, times the, uh, times the uh, four employees, okay? It's per employee. If the tax credit is taken, Green must reduce its reduction for wages by the amount of the, um, of the credit that was given. Okay, so they're not going to let you deduct the full amount for against your revenue, obviously, if you got a credit. Okay, and that goes on for the first year of employment only. Okay, no credit after the first year. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, this one, which is very similar uh, to the example. And uh, Cardinal Corporation hires two persons certified to be eligible employees for work opportunity tax credit under the general rule, whatever, food stamp, each of whom is paid 9000 during the year. As a result of this event, Cardinal Company may claim a work opportunity credit. And just look at the rationale here. They are in the 40% category because they worked what? They worked uh, more than the 400 hours. Did they tell us that somewhere? How long did they work? Cardinal hires two employees under the general rule. Okay, I don't know how I'm supposed to know that they qualify for the 40% unless maybe none of the answers work with uh, what's the lower amount, with the 25%. I'm not sure why they didn't call it out. Or maybe because they're saying general rules, I guess. But it seemed like the question should have been a little more specific and told us they were, you know, uh, for at least 400 hours to get the 40%. Okay? That's pretty easy to remember, 400 hours, 40%. Okay? So anyway, we take this 40% and then the, what, the maximum is 6,000. And then it's per employee, right? So since they have two employees, you just multiply that by two. I can't explain to you why that question. I didn't know that before. Why that question? Can you get it with the 25%? Nothing, none of the answers come out with 25%. So I guess that's how you would have backed it into having to use the 40%. Okay. Okay, good. Um, let's take a look at low income housing. Uh, the way the federal government used to do public housing was like this. They would build these huge, you know, apartment buildings. You still see some of them around in, uh, in San Francisco, although you can't go that high. But you go to the East Coast, you see these big, giant apartment-looking buildings, these towers, and you're like, geez, what the heck is that? It's public housing, okay? And so what they did was they would create these, you know, almost like prisons, of you know multi-story prisons of people that were low income all living in these uh you know federally built housing and it's like the worst social experiment ever so what they started saying is we shouldn't do this this way we should instead encourage developers to develop these uh, public housing and as long as they make some of that available to low income individuals, probably through Section 8 or something like that, we'll give them a tax credit. So what you have these days in public housing is what they call mixed income property. You have some people living right next to others. I'm paying full rent. My neighbor next door is maybe getting, you know, Section 8 or vouchers or something like that um, from the government to uh, make up the, dish, the difference between the market rate and the um, and the the amount that the person would have to come out of their pocket. Now they have to meet certain income requirements. So a lot of times, what'll happen? You may be involved in one of these. They'll call in a CPA firm. 
to come in and take a look to see that the individuals really are low-income individuals and they've rented so much to uh, people that meet certain threshold requirements for low income. Okay, So if you build that sort of housing, they're going to give you a, what, a tax credit to incentivize individuals developing that. Okay, So if you take a look, um, they tell us that to encourage that um, more than one, more than any other, we have the low income housing credit, which is influenced by non-tax factors, for example, um, issued on a, um, they're issued on a nationwide allocation basis through congressional funding. So there's only so much of this sort of tax credit available. Occupants are low income tenants. If the income does not exceed a specific percentage of the area's median gross income in HUD, Department of Housing and Urban Development has all the appropriate guidelines for that. Okay? So the credit is claimed over a 10 year period as long as the property continues to meet the required conditions. So is this Sarah again? This is the second Sarah we've had. She invests what? Spends a million dollars to build qualified low income housing that is completed on January 1st of the current year. The entire project is rented to low income families. The credit rate for the property placed in service during January is 7.48%. And I'm assuming either Congress or IRS or HUD, sometimes they put these agencies together. They'll say Treasury and HUD, you work on this together and come up with the appropriate rates, whatever it is, right? But for 2017, in this example, it was 7.48%. So she can claim a credit of what? 74,800, that's the million, times the 7.48%. And uh, again, if she had only made the uh, property available to what? Uh, to low income, then it's the whole amount. If it was 75%, um, then of course she only gets 75% of that uh, credit. In other words, 25% of the individuals are regular market rate and those 75% are low income. And it doesn't have to be um, any minimum percentage. It could be 50-50, whatever, okay? And so she would have to reduce that. And she can continue to take that in the current year and what? The following nine years. And so that's a pretty nice little, uh, little deal there. If you do something like that, I think, that's very helpful and that you get that nice tax credit year after year. You're still collecting the rent in that situation. And we have what? We don't have any more of these towers of, you know, public housing that were just going nuts. Now, the only problem that happened with this whole idea is what they did is they tore down a lot of those high rise towers which had the bad condition that I was talking about, but it also housed a lot of people, right? So now you're going with these lower level, you know, maybe two, three story type buildings that they started putting up. And what happened in Miami is they ran out of money and they didn't have enough housing. They tore down a tower and they ran out of money to develop these more, you know, flat type of mixed housing type of things they just ran out of funds for the overall project and so a lot of people just ended up homeless as a result of this and it caused this huge controversy uh in miami here a few years back and they asked my office to look at that and try to understand what happened i got assigned to that assignment and they told uh you know we told congress that we don't look at just one housing agency. The GAO would do what my office looks at the whole country. We'll look at all the housing agencies. So we downloaded information about all 3,100 housing agencies. And what we found is that for the ones that, um, the one that went bad, there were other housing agencies that were showing similar uh, financial trends and stuff. And so we uh, suggested that HUD should improve their oversight over this whole process. But uh, the idea is, you know, a good idea. Actually making it work and implementing it could have some uh, actual problems. Okay. okay. Uh, rehabilitating um, uh, facilities for um, disabled access credit. Okay. And credit available for el eligible access expenditures made by small businesses includes amounts paid to remove barriers 
that would otherwise make business inaccessible to disabled and handicapped individuals. I don't know who's the handicapped individuals. This is supposed to be disabled. I don't know why somebody put, that's not me, why somebody put in handicapped. Disabled is not, I don't have to put handicapped on there. Now, notice they say uh, facilities placed in service before November 6, 1990. Now, why are they saying that? Because by that time, we got it that when you construct a building, and there's probably requirements, state and local and federal, that you make buildings have the accessibility, right? So it's always funny to me, you think back, and you guys are too young to know this, but there was a time where people would argue that. Oh, no, you don't have to make the building accessible. People would literally sit there and argue. So keep that in mind when you hear, you know, some idea that sounds strange to you and you hear people arguing against it. 20 years from now, people are going to say, really? You know, we actually went ahead and used to burn. I'll make a prediction right now. Maybe 20 years from now, maybe, maybe a little longer. People will say, really? We used to pollute the air with vehicles that we burn fuel that caused the air to be polluted? Really? We used to do that? Okay, so anyway. All right, just like they used to dump raw sewage into the bay. In the 50s, you flushed your toilet, it went straight to the bay. Okay, now they do what? And everybody, oh, okay, all right. Then all of a sudden, hey, you know, we're killing everything. You know, there's all kinds of birds and stuff dying. Okay, so they do what? They treat it now so that by the time it gets out into the bay, it's almost clean. They use chlorine to kill everything, and then they have the ability to dechlorinate the water. So by the time it goes back in the bay, they're almost putting fresh water back in. There's a time, oh, we can't spend the money on that. Okay, so all these things that you hear proposed now that sound liberal and sound crazy, 20 years from now, somebody will be going, well, of course, we're going to do it that way. Okay, all right, so you take a look, and let's just see what the credit amount is. Meanwhile, back to accounting, and that you have the best bet. You have what? They're going to give you a 50% deduction on any amounts that exceed 250 up to 10,000. So that's a funny way of saying the maximum is what? 5,000. Leave it to the tax code to come up with some weird way to say that, right? Okay. So the maximum is 5,000. So you take a look. Pretty easy example here. Eligible small businesses makes 11,000 of capital improvements to the building and had been placed in service in June 1990. Um, um, and so the improvements made uh, it more accessible and it constitutes eligible expenditures for the credit. So the amount of the credit is going to be what? Well, even though they made 11,000, we're capped at what? 10,050 minus the 250. So we're capped at what? 10,000 and it's 50% of that, so they can take 5,000. Even though they spent more than that, they're capped out at that 10,250 minus the 250. Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look, <clears throat> and let's take a look at uh, credit for pension startup cost. And so what they want to do is encourage, again, smaller business to go ahead and develop uh, pension plans for their employees. So um, when you start up, you'd have these uh, different costs such as uh, payroll system changes, et cetera, educating the employees of what their benefits are and all that sort of thing, okay? And so um, what happens? The credit is 50% of qualified startup cost and an eligible, uh, eligible employee uh, is one with fewer than a, uh, an eligible employer is one with fewer than a hundred employees who have earned at least five thousand dollars of compensation. The maximum credit is five hundred dollars based on a maximum of a thousand qualifying expenses, and the deduction for the startup cost incurred is reduced by the amount of the credit. Okay. So you have to have at least uh, a maximum. Uh, you can not have a max. You have to have a maximum of a thousand qualifying expenditures. So the credit be can be claimed five hundred dollars for qualifying incurred for what three years. 
Okay, so when they're talking about startup, they're going to limit that to three years. So the total would obviously be 1500 Okay, so if you take a look, um, we have this example where they spent what? They spent 12, but we're capped at what? At a thousand, so you keep, take 50% of whatever you spent up to a thousand, and then you can't take any more, right? We multiply that by 50%, and so they got the maximum of the uh, $500, okay? And then the deduction for those expenses, now you'd have to take off the credit that you got, so they spent 12, they could still take a deduction on their, you know, for their business tax purposes of uh, 700 the 1200 minus the 500. You just can't deduct the full 12. Okay? So it's basically what you spend up to times 50% up to what? Up to 1000. Okay? All right, good. Let's go ahead and take a look at employer provided child care. Okay? So they want to encourage employers to develop, basically create a uh, child care facility for their employee for their employees, right? To help individuals that you know have both parents or whatever are working, and they want to uh, allow for the deduction. Okay, so when we look at this, we can do what? Conduct it as an ordinary business expense, of course. That's the case with all of these, but we're going to probably want to take the credit, right? And so the credit is limited annually to 150,000 and it has two components, 25% of qualified care expenses and 10% of resource and referral services. You know, uh, some employers, um, my office used to have this, like you can call in and say, my kids are driving me nuts. I want to, you know, send them to military school, what should I do, or whatever, and they'll talk you out of it, or whatever, or they even have it, they even have that kind of thing for, like, elder care, you can call and say, you know, I want my dad to move out, and I don't know how to tell him, you know, that sort of thing, well, those are considered part of that sort of thing, um, but they're going to only let you take 10% of those, so qualified child care expenses include cost of adding acquiring, okay, expanding the facilities into a child care facility, child care resource and referral services, amounts paid incurred in a contract to provide child care resource and referral services to employee, like a hotline we can call and talk about, you know, issues surrounding raising kids, I guess, I don't know anything about it, but, okay, so anyway. Qualified expenses otherwise deductible by the taxpayer are reduced by the amount of the credit. Again, same rule, right? That's been consistent. If you're going to take the credit, you can't take the uh, full amount of the uh, expenses. You have to reduce it by the credit. Okay? If within 10 years of being placed in service, a child care facility ceases to be used in providing child care for employees, the taxpayer recaptures a portion of the credit previously claimed, and I'm sure it'll be, you know, the fraction of the 10 years that it ran. So we've got this, what, during the year, TAN company constructed a child care facility for 400000 to be used by its employees who have preschool age children in need of child care services while their parents are at work. In addition, TAN incurred salaries for child care workers and other administrative costs associated with the facility of a hundred thousand. Okay, so as a result, they can take the credit of what? Credit is going to be a hundred and twenty-five thousand times the what? Times the twenty-five percent. It's the four hundred. It's uh, four hundred. What they spent plus the hundred thousand they spent, and that's in the twenty-five percent category. Okay, so. Now, they're going to have to reduce the basis in the facility, uh, the add to the, um, I guess they acquired the facility? No, they constructed it. So any amount they spent constructing in the building or whatever, how that worked, they're going to have to do what? Reduce that basis by the portion of the credit that is attributable to that construction. Okay, and so the way they came up with the 100000 is if you see, I guess I can put it here, 
if you sit here and look at this, they spent a total here of 500,000, didn't they? The four plus the one. So they spent 400 plus 100. That's a total of what? 500,000. Of that 500,000, 400,000 related to the construction, didn't it? And so that equals 20%, I mean, excuse me, 80%. And so since that's 80%, then of the total credit, 125,000, 80% of that equals what, 100,000? So that was the part that they went ahead and said was attributable because we have to know how much of the total that got spent. We have to know how much is going to be um, subtracted from the basis of whatever the improvement was, right? Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at um, the earned income credit okay and when we look at the earned income credit uh, it is eligible for um, uh, eligible for the credit depends not only on the tax permitting earned income but also whether or not they have dependents uh, that are qualifying child and we already talked about that in back in chapter three so in addition to being available for taxpayers with a qualifying child, the income tax credit is available to certain workers uh, without children. However, the provision is available only to taxpayers ages 65 through 64 who cannot be claimed as dependent on another taxpayer's tax return. So we've got Maria, age 30, earned income for, year, for the year 6,000. She's single and has no children. Maria can qualify for an earned income credit because she's what, less than 25? Okay, and uh, even though she doesn't have any children, she's less than 25. Will, uh, Willa, age 20, report income of 6,000. She is single, but she has what? She has no children, so Willa does not qualify for in earned income uh, credit until she reaches age 25, and then she can go ahead and uh, start to take it. And of course, if she has children before 25, then she can uh, take it. You know, if you're single, you're subsidizing married people and you're subsidizing people with children. You realize that, right? So if you have a barren existence that ends when you die, you're going to have to pay a, a tax on that. Okay? All right, so you come over and you take a look at... Uh, computing um, the credit and for 2017 the maximum earned income credit is 3400 for a taxpayer taxpayer with one qualifying child 5616 for taxpayer payer with two children and 6318 for taxpayer with three or more qualifying children and I look at that and I'm like so basically what they're saying is there's some sort of you know fixed cost associated with having children, right? Because why would they not give you more on a, you know, on a linear schedule for the different amount of kids you have? I don't know. So maybe, you know, they figure it's the kids can share shoes or something, you know, if they get to a certain age or the hand-me-downs of clothes, okay? I'm not sure what they're, how they're coming up with that schedule. But a taxpayer with no qualifying children can qualify for an income, income tax credit for a maximum of $510. Now clearly, they're trying to make this available to what? They're not gonna get an earned income tax credit to, you know, Trump, okay, you know, and that, well, you make a certain amount of money, they're gonna phase you out, right? And so it's for lower threshold incomes, and you can see that the earned income tax increases uh, from a, about 23900 to about 53900 53, So the credit for those with qualifying uh, children phases out to zero as your income increases from 23900 to 53900 So they start to phase it out if you start making certain amounts of money. By the time you make 
this 53,000, whatever, they have completely phased it out. And there are uh, tables that would be used which are not in our textbook at all. So I would not hold you accountable on the test to know the uh, phase out percentages as we go because there's really nothing in the textbook and I don't expect you to start digging through and trying to find the tables that they use for the phase out uh, as you go up uh, in these ranks of the income. Okay, So the most I would expect you to know is what? How much for one kid? How much for two? How much for three? How much for none? And then, um, you know, I'd make sure that everybody was below the phase out amount so that you don't have to worry about figuring out how to phase these out. Okay. All right, good. So you come over and uh, we also have a uh, child tax credit. Okay. And the credit amount is a thousand per child. Okay. Eligible children are under age 17. U.S. citizen and claimed as a dependent on the taxpayer's tax return. Those are the requirements. Maximum credit is a thousand per child, and the available credit is phased out, beginning with AGI at a hundred and ten thousand for joint filers, seventy-five thousand for single. Okay, but that doesn't even make sense. Why would it be less for single? You still have the same amount of kids. I don't get it. And it should be more for the single person, shouldn't it? Because they're having to deal with the kids without anybody else. But anyway, get married. They want you. They want you married. Don't be running around single. Okay. All right. Especially with kids, you know. Okay. So the credit is phased out by fifty dollars for each thousand of the AGI above the threshold. And because the maximum credit amount depends on the number of qualifying children, the income at which the credit is phased out completely also depends on the number of qualifying children. Okay, So um, you take a look and Juanito and Alberto are, um, are married and file a joint return claiming their children ages 6 and 8. So they're young enough, right? The AGI is 122,400. Juanito and Alberto's maximum child credit is 2,000. But because they have these AGI in excess of the threshold, we would have to do what? We would have to uh, reduce that by $50 for every thousand that they are over the threshold. So if you're saying, well, how do you get that? The threshold is what? Threshold is that they're making 122,400, right? We divide that by one, I mean, subtract off of that 110,000. So what's that, 12,400? And then you divide that by what? A thousand? And so they are what? Basically 12.4 thousands over the threshold. And uh, they round it up, though, to 13. And so 13 times the $50 is how we got the 650. So they have to reduce that 2,000, the 1,000 per child, by this uh, 650. So they can only take the 1350, right? OK. So for every 1,000 over the threshold, they make you take 50 bucks off. And I guess it was thanks to, uh, what's the daughter's name? Ivanka? I guess it was thanks to Ivanka, supposedly, when they were deliberating the changes, she burst in and said, you have to increase the child tax credit to $2,000 uh, per child. And everybody said, oh. <laughs> so and then you get 2000 per child now. All right. Got to give her credit for something, right? All right. Okay. So you take a look and um, let's see how this works. Harry, uh, Harry and Wilma are married and filed joint income tax return. On their tax return, they reported 44000 of adjusted gross income, 20000 salary earned by Harry, and 24000 salary earned by Wilma, and claim two exemptions for their dependent children. 
during the year, they pay the following amount. Daycare, they pay Blue Ridge Housekeeping Services, they pay uh, Harry's mother, uh, Mrs. Mason, a thousand, okay? So Harry and Wilma may claim a child credit and dependent care expense of, and first, we have to do what? First, we have to set up the uh, amounts that are allowable here. And all of these would be allowable, 6,200. But we're capped at what? We're capped at 6,000, right? We're capped at 6,000. So the maximum that they can take is what? Is 1,200. Do you have slides on this? No, we did the credit. Did we do child care expenses? I don't think we did. Okay. Huh. That's interesting. Well, let me add some of those in for next time. I thought we I thought I had put some slides in. I know I put a question on in here for uh, child care expenses that are deductible, but uh, I think I got confused between the child credit and uh, deductible child care. And it's not just child care, it's also dependent care, elderly care, that sort of thing. Um, so I'll put some in there for that, because that is not the child care, it's two, the maximum is 2,000, right? Okay, so we'll look at that, and I'll put some up for that next time. Okay. All right, let's take a look at payment procedures now, okay? So we're kind of done with the credits. Let's take a look at payment procedures in which um, you're going to have to pay what they call FICA, okay? FI, FICA is a combination of Social Security, which is a 6.2%, and Medicare, which is 1.45%, uh, okay? Now, when we look at this, there is a limit. Let me take these circles out. I'll have to, there is a limit on the maximum amount that you take for Social Security. And in 2017, it was 127200 So they take Social Security... They withhold that from you until you get up to income at 127,200 or more, and then they stop taking Social Security from you at that point. Okay? Now I look at that and I'm thinking they should just keep going. Social Security's gone broke. One of the things they could do is just keep going. If you make a million dollars, and they'll take six point whatever, six point two percent of that. Okay? There is no wage age limit for Medicare. Okay? So if you take a look in 2017, Keisha earned uh, a salary of 140,000, and uh, therefore FICA tax withheld from her salary is what? And we deal with the cap for the Social Security. We do not apply the cap to what? To the Medicare. So we take the full 140,000 times the 1.45 for that. So there's $9,916.40 that needs to be paid to the government for her, and then her employer has to do what? Has to match that, okay? And that goes into her account for Social Security. Now, the reality is what? The government takes the money that is supposed to go into account for Social Security and does what with it? Spends it, right? So when they report to you the, um, the uh, deficit, they do not include amounts that they were supposed to put into the Social Security fund that they actually spent. If they did that, the deficit would increase tremendously um, beyond where it is. So they really kind of understate that deficit to you every year. Okay, but uh, they call that off budget and they do it. It's a political game. They use the accounting trick of not including it as part of the deficit in any particular year. They spend that money even though they're supposed to put it in the Social Security Trust Fund. Okay, now you come over and you take a look and uh, they give us the rates again that we saw previously, okay? And, and if an employee is over with help for Social Security, then the excess is going to be refunded. Now, how do you end up getting 
withheld more than the uh, maximum, over withheld. And that comes up when you have what? Basically, more than one job. You work for a couple of different companies and company A doesn't know that company B's already withheld the maximum on you. Maybe you have one job where you're making 127,000, another job where you're making 50,000. Both jobs are doing what? Withholding social security and at some point, you, they withhold too much. And so you get a refund for that amount that they over withheld because you have two withholders going on, okay? Now, um, you know this, you file a W-4 when you work and you say the number of you know, exemptions and stuff you want and then they tell you what your withholdings are on your W-2, okay? So when you look at that W-2, any amount that was over withheld, you can, reclaim, you can uh, file a refund for, right? Okay. Okay, now you also have to make estimated tax payments if you believe you will have a tax liability in a given year of over $1,000. So basically the government is saying, hey, we don't want you filling out your W-4 in such a manner that you don't have enough tax withheld so that you end up owing $50,000 at the end of the year. We're not going to let you pay, play with our money. We're going to require that you, what, make estimated payments if you think you're going to end up with a liability, okay? Now, to avoid penalties, so they will penalize you if you underpay, you have to have withholding that is up to at least 90% of the current year's tax. So you can't, um, you know, end up with a liability that is, what, more than 10% of your current year's tax. Or if you just give 100% of what you paid last year, they say, okay, you're making a good faith estimate to pay us what you owe us, and so that's okay. Now, the exception is increased to 110% of last year's if you're now um, exceeding $150,000 of income. Again, they don't want big time you know, big rollers sitting there and playing with the government's money. They want their money, right? And they want it paid to them on time, okay? And so what happens? They are going to require that you make these estimated payments quarterly, okay? So April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and then January 15th of the next year, uh, which is basically paying it quarterly. Obviously, we roll into the next year, right? Okay. Okay, now you take a look and self-employment tax, what happens here? Well, if you're self-employed, then you don't have an employer sitting there withholding for you, right? So they're going to expect you to pay now not only your share of your Social Security and your Medicare, your FICA, but now you also have to pay for yourself the what? The employees, uh, excuse me, the employers. Yeah, you're kind of treating yourself as the employee, but you're also your own employer, right? So we double up the rates for the Social Security. It's 12.4, the first 127,000. Medicare, 1.45 times two, it's 2.9%. So you're having to pay both the employer and the employee share, right? Okay, so you come over and uh, you take a look. Taxpayers receive a deduction from net self-employment income of 7.65 for purposes of calculating the actual self-employment tax and then you're going to be able to take a deduction for 50% of the self-employment. In other words, you can take a deduction for sort of the employer's portion, but you can't take a deduction for your own portion. But you get to consider what? you get to consider the FICA, the employer's portion, you get to consider that as a what? As a deduction from your, from your, uh, from your revenue. You get to consider that a legitimate business expense. So you end up sitting there and having to say, well, okay, I need to figure out what the amount of deduction is but I don't know what the amount of the deduction is unless I know what my net income is, but I don't know what my net income is until I make the deduction. And so the way you would set that up is you go ahead and say, okay, let's say I make $1,000. That's my self-employment income. And then I'm going to get to deduct what? 
point zero seven six five times x, and that'll equal x. Okay, because I'm going to be able to take a deduction of, uh, for my income. I'm going to be able to take a deduction of my FICA that is based on my income, right, on this thing. Okay, so once you do that, then you have to sit there and do the algebra. So a thousand equals, and we have to add what? Point. 0, 0.765 of x to each side, so we end up a thousand being equal to what? To one thousand, one point zero seven six five during the algebra. And so if you take the thousand and you divide that by one point seven, not five six, okay. five six or six dollars. Okay, if you divide that on each side, that means that the that the x, the income equals what? Equals nine hundred and twenty-eight dollars and ninety-three cents. And so now that we know what x is, then the what? The deduction here is going to be point or the, the tax that I'm going to have to pay is going to be what self-employment tax is going to be point zero seven six five times what my income after considering the deduction of the uh, nine hundred twenty-eight or whatever that comes out to be nine hundred twenty-eight thousand uh, ninety-three. Which means that I can take a deduction of seventy-one dollars and six cents. Okay, so it's kind of like calculating a bonus, where a bonus is based on a percentage of income. You would kind of have to do that same sort of thing, right? Okay, so that would be the best way to come up with the amount of the deduction. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and. Um, Self-employment tax may be reduced to zero if self-employed individual also receives FIC wages in excess of the ceiling amount. So, of course, that would go up to what? Up to the 127000 whatever it is. And then you wouldn't have to take any more, FI, any more Social Security part of the FICA, but you would have to do what? You always have to pay tax on the uh, Medicare, Medicare portion. Okay. So let's take a look at um, this one. Kelly re had recorded 86,000 net earnings from a data transfer service job. During the year, Kelly also received 54,000 in wages as an employee of a small video imaging firm. Kelly's self-employment income subject to the Social Security portion, 12.4%, is 73,000. It's the 127.2 minus what? minus the 54,000, uh, which is the um, uh, 127,200, which is the, the total minus what? Minus what she's receiving from wages, because they're withholding the tax for her, right? 127,200 is the max, isn't it? The job that she has at the video imaging company is what? Fifty-four thousand, and they're withholding that the Social Security quarter on that job, right? So her only exposure for the self-employment tax is the amount that uh, she makes over that one point seven two hundred, which is what the seventy-three thousand two hundred, and that's the amount that she is um, going to have to pay the self-employment tax on because her employer is covering fifty-four thousand of the threshold, right? Okay, and so that gives you the 73,200 times the 12.4. This reduces the Social Security portion of the self-employment of 907680. And then uh, all of her self-employment earnings are subject to the Medicare portion. So we would pick up the 2.9% uh, uh, is, is not applicable. So we're going to have to deal with the 2.9 to get the Social Security. Okay, that's what he's twelve point four. That's the six whatever times two. Okay.
All right, so Pat generated self-employment income of 76,000. The self-employment factors, now, um, they did it a little bit different here. And the James came up with the 76,000, and then they multiplied that by what? 92.35, essentially taking 100 minus what? Minus the, uh, the uh, 0.07. into this next section, okay, because we're up on uh, time here, and uh, we will finish this up next time. Derek will be here uh, tomorrow. We'll be here to go over uh, homework questions from Chapter 6 and 7. We'll knock out Chapter, uh, not 6 and 7, Chapter uh, 11 and 12, and then um, we will pick up on Tuesday, um, finishing up a few of these straggling items and then jumping in, we'll start corporate tax discussion next time. All right? Okay, guys. Have a good weekend. We'll see you on Tuesday. Bye. Uh, so, I have a question about this. So, mm -hmm. all of the net self employment earnings are subject to the 2.9%. Yes. That means I have to use 86,000 times the 2.9%. 86 plus 54. Oh, so total. Yeah, there's no cap, whereas Social Security uh, has the cap so on 127,000. Like, no matter what the dollar is, I just have to use the total time to That's right. There's okay. no cap on the um, on the Medicare. And also for this, why I use, the, this is the limit, right? Yeah. And I use that minus the 54. The 54, because they would held tax for her on the 54. So her only exposure of amounts that she wouldn't have had Social Security paid is the yeah, is the seventy three because they withheld tax up to the fifty four for her. So now her exposure of what she should pay self employment tax for is any amount over the threshold that what wasn't withheld on the other job. So finally, she's paying the like the total of the Fifty four thousand already had withheld. Mm -hmm. There's still seventy three thousand so that is subject to the tax that okay. she would have to cover herself. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. I don't know who's next. Yeah. Yeah, they do have me down for it, yeah. Uh, you can take the entire class in the ethics call and assume you don't need it for accounting purposes. However, it only counts towards the seven non-specific units that have to have certain words in it. You have to have up to three units of the ten have to be constituted of uh, a class that it covers accounting industry ethics. And Paul de San Mateo has that class as well. So you can use it against the seven. But three units must be accounting industry ethics. Class. Oh, yeah. But you can use that class, all three units against the seven. Now, the law says that you can only use one. Yeah. But if you look at the tip sheet, they took that off of the tip sheet. And I called the state board and I was like, why is it, not on, why is it in the law but not in the tip sheet? And they said, well, we're, using, we're going by the tip sheet and we're going to take all three units. So then I'm like, well, then you should change the law. And then they started inviting me to call my representative to tell them that I think they should change the law. I'm like, okay, I'm done. So they'll count all three units of the Ottoman class, even though the law states only one. So a lot of literature you look at, they're going by the law. I think even Berkeley's um, information says only one of the three units, three units of that class. You can take them out. Yeah. Towards that, up to the up to the seven, yeah, against the seven. Yeah, yeah. I just made up a 
this fountain is what is uh, income would be before making the deduction for the uh, employer for the Social Security. Uh, yeah, um, but then what I'm saying is that if you pay a person on the income, so to get to what is the amount of the deduction to be based on the income, Set it up on the and that means he's going to come to the end of the 2003 after he takes the deduction for the time period. And so the tax that he's paying is 71.6, that's the stuff they got. So it's one of those weird catch 22 in there. You have to. It must be very hard yeah, well, that's the way I do it. I mean, they, you could do it the way they did on that last problem, which what they do is put one minus one, you know, seven, six, five, whatever that is, two, three percent or something, and get that as the amount of income, and you multiply that by the, and they did fifteen uh, percent of that as oh, like oh, that's so good. They took the full thing. Uh, yeah. 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 But I think this way, to me, even though it's longer, to me, you can kind of see what you're doing, right? And it, as I said in the discussion, it is similar to, um, you. Ha sometimes you see questions where they say, what is the amount of the bonus? And the bonus is based on...